Hey, this is Tom Webster, and this is Sounds Profitable for Tuesday, January 23rd, 2023. My favorite data points of 2022. This week, I start week three of sitting on the jury for a civil lawsuit, and you would have thought I would have been immediately disqualified when I told the judge I'm in podcasting, but here we are. But still, the podcast must go on. At the end of last year, Brian Barletta, my steadfast partner here at Sounds Profitable, issued me a challenge. No, I said, I I can't do that many push-ups. But he also challenged me to look back on all of the great research that we did together in 2022 and come up with a handful of what I thought were the most impactful data points. Now this I can handle. So without any more preamble, here are my three favorite data points from 2022. Number one, the truth about crime. We were delighted to be able to put out podcasting's first study on brand safety and suitability. It's called Safe and Sound. And I think we focus a lot on the safety aspect, which is really a binary determination and not as much as we could have perhaps on the suitability aspect, which is really about relevance. Podcasting is fortunate to have many tools available to help make advertisers make good choices, but simply screening out certain keywords can leave a lot of opportunity on the table. True crime is a really good example of this. Now, we heard from a lot of our partners that some brands were, and I want to apologize for this, gun shy about advertising in true crime podcasts for fear of being associated with unpleasant topics. It's probably a stretch to go from hearing a Prius commercial on a true crime show to making a leap about Toyota's support of murder. But still, many brands are so afraid of an error of commission running a spot on something really gruesome that they routinely commit errors of omission, not being on some great shows with highly relevant and engaged audiences. And that's why a couple of data points from last year's Safe and Sound report really, really stayed with me. Uh, And we'll post here in the show notes, but uh, by all means, download the study. Uh, I, I won't go into too much detail on the graphs here, but The bottom line is that true crime lovers are very passionate about the content that they love. And it's also an audience that has a very specific demographic profile. It's massive with women, and there are even finer distinctions to be made there. But what the data points that uh, I pulled from Safe and Sound really tell us is that fans of true crime are not only tolerant of advertising, which, by the way, is all many media channels can ever really hope for is ad tolerance. They actually like it. They like it when brands support true crime, and they remember those brands for doing it. They support the kind of content that they can't get on demand in any other place. In in fact, you could almost call it gratitude. Kind of remarkable for advertising. So where I hope we continue to drive as an industry with brand suitability is towards smarter audience insights and away from simple keyword screenouts. The core audience for true crime is distinctive, engaged, and passionate, and for many brands, perfect. Uh, my number two takeaway from last year, I like to call it instant receptivity. Our study of creative execution in podcast advertising after these messages involved playing a bit of content from a fantastic podcast, The Jordan Harbinger Show, and grafting in one of several different treatments of host read or announcer read ads. Now, the sample for this study were not necessarily listeners to Jordan's show. In fact, about 70% were not, but they were still highly receptive to the show, to its content, and notably to the advertising. Now, I remember when I first started out in media research, my first boss, Frank Cody, used to tell me that people had three phases of hearing a message, like an ad, and I'm probably misremembering this, but the first time that you hear an effective ad, your response is generally, what? You, you crane your neck a bit. You strain to hear what is said. It registers at some level, but you're not sure what. The second stage is something like, come again? It has your attention, but now you want some details. And the final stage is, oh, that's when you get it. A good ad combined with repetition or frequency can generate all three phases over time. But what we learned in After These Messages is that compelling spoken word content, like Jordan's show, plus either a host-read ad 
or a suitable and compelling announcer at ad can provide a shortcut to that process. In our study, despite hearing the ads only once, three quarters of the sample were able to recapitulate the specific brand unaided. That's remarkable. Yes, the live host red ad featured the strongest recall. It was an impressive 80%. But the announcer red ad was also extremely strong. 67% recalled the brand name for the brand that we tested. Now, if you've ever touched brand lift research, you'll recognize that all of these numbers are quite high. 80% host red, 67% announcer red, and you know, about three quarters overall. But it's not even fair to compare these numbers to brand lift benchmarks. In a proper pre-post campaign measurement, you might get solid numbers after a campaign is run, and the audience for a given podcast has heard the ad multiple times. But the data from after these messages, well, most of these people weren't even listeners to the show, and they heard the spot exactly once. The magical marriage of compelling content and suitable, well-executed advertising, it's almost a secret weapon for podcasting. The host red ad in particular offers brands a shortcut to awareness and a shortcut to willingness to consider that brand that might require significantly more repetition or frequency in other media. And my final data point from my favorite uh, data points from the research that we presented last year, call this staying curious. One of the things that uh, kind of struck me looking at our study from last year, the creators, which uh, was the podcast industry's first credible study of the people who make podcasts, was the difference in educational attainment, educational level between people who tell us that they've ever created a podcast or ever worked on a podcast and the U.S. population in general. It is a really, really stark difference. Uh, the percentage of advanced graduate degrees alone uh, it is massively over-indexed from where it is in the U.S. population. And in just that one demographic comparison, I think we see a real story there. Podcast creators are really different dogs to the U.S. population. I mean, we all knew that. But looking at the educational background of the average U.S. citizen compared to the average podcast creator, podcasters are really different dogs. Now, it's very likely in any form of monetized content that you would see a difference here. There are certainly class implications. But I don't want to make any of those distinctions. I just want to point out that we podcast creators are very different humans to most people. And guess what? Most people don't regularly listen to podcasts. Now, if we're going to grow this medium, we have to be passionate evangelists for the space. We have to tell our friends, our coworkers, even grandma about podcasting. No one is coming to save you. But we have to do this work ourselves. But more importantly, we have to stay curious. We have to look at ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves, why most people aren't regular listeners? Have we done all we can? Or are we just different dogs? I think we can do more. Expanding the reach of podcasting isn't just about telling people that it exists. It's making content that they care about. And you can't do that without understanding the humans, understanding all the humans. And I like to call this the Bon Jovi problem. Whenever someone tells me they can't understand how Bon Jovi has sold 50 million records, for example, I respond that this only means you don't understand millions of people. We all have a lot of opportunity ahead of us. If we ask the hard questions and more importantly, actually seek the answers. Have a wonderful 2023. We'll keep producing more data like this all year long and staying curious. And I hope you do too. Thanks again for listening to my article, my three favorite data points of 2022. I'm Tom Webster. This episode was built using Spooler and hosted on Art19. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.